Welcome. Even if you're in denial, and I hope you're not, you know about climate change. Everyone can see the wildfires and drought in California, the fatal flash floods in Arizona, the punch of a hurricane pounding Mexico's Baja coast, the strongest in nearly 50 years, battering locals and trapping tourists in their hotels. These disasters are made more powerful by global warming, and it's only going to get worse for us and for future generations, unless we act now. That's why more than 120 world leaders are coming to New York City next Tuesday for the UN's Global Summit on Climate, trying yet again to provoke governments to get on with it, reduce those carbon emissions that are heating up the atmosphere before it's too late. So here in New York, in the days leading up to the summit, there's a lot happening to keep the UN on point. The People's Climate March, perhaps the largest ever, with over a thousand organizations behind it. A three-day gathering of religious leaders at Union Theological Seminary on what the National Catholic Reporter calls the number one pro-life issue of our time, climate change. And on Monday, there will be a mass sit-in on Wall Street aimed at fossil fuel extractors and the investors who love them. But of all the people here for these events, there's one in particular I wanted you to meet. Kelsey Juliana is her name, and I learned about her because she's part of an unusual legal effort to slow down global warming. Kelsey lives in Oregon, where a law professor named Mary Christina Wood, author of this book, Nature's Trust, has created a legal strategy to protect the atmosphere. The basic notion goes all the way back to ancient Rome. And it says that government holds in public trust for all its citizens the resources they need to survive and can be held accountable if it fails to protect those resources for future generations. And that's how Kelsey Juliana wound up in court at age 15. Yes, 15. Even as a teenager, she was known for her environmental activism. Frankly, it came naturally to her. Her parents met in the 90s when they were protesting the destruction of old growth forests by the logging industry. Kelsey followed in their footsteps. She agreed to be one of two plaintiffs in a suit claiming the state of Oregon was not doing all it could to protect their future by reducing global warming. The first judge said his court didn't have jurisdiction to resolve the issue, but the Oregon Court of Appeals found merit in the case and told the lower court, try again. While the legal process creeps forward, Kelsey has turned 18, graduated from high school, and is walking across the country in the Great March for Climate Action that started in Los Angeles and will end up in Washington, D.C. on November 1st. Kelsey, welcome. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Did you personally explore this public trust doctrine? Did you want to know what it was about? To be honest, when I you know, first got invited to be on the case um, in my own state. I was going into freshman year of high school. I had a lot of things um, on my plate, on my mind. And when I got the call, you know, would you like to be a plaintiff for this lawsuit? I didn't know really what a plaintiff meant. I didn't know all the legal terms. I didn't know what it really meant. The thing that caught with me is you are doing this to protect natural resources and the environment for your generation, for your friends, and for your future generations. You know, it's also an honor. Uh, it's an honor to be a plaintiff on a lawsuit because it's, it's a movement that I'm a part of. It's in no way my lawsuit. Um, I'm just a representative, you know, of, of the people of Oregon. But at 15, you should have been reading The Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? I mean, you, not legal briefs, not, not delving into the public <laughs> trust doctrine. You know what? <laughs> Blame it on my parents, you know. How so? Um, they brought me up with this. You know, people always ask, when did I start this? If you really want to track it down, my first rally, I believe I was two months old. When I was in middle school, um, I was known as the eco girl, the girl who would run down the hallway in my school and turn off all the lights and, you know, th <laughs> things like that. Do some of your friends in high school think you're weird? No. Um, they, they seem to all support me but not join me, um, which, is, which is almost worse than not supporting me, <laughs> you know, because they get it and they don't do anything. Um, and who, to why that is, I understand. Um, hey, we have college we need to think about. We have SATs. 
we have soccer practice, we have to make an impression for, for our college admissions office. You know, we have so many things in the immediate future and climate change is such a long-term thing to think about. And even though, yes, we are seeing the effects of climate change today, yesterday, a lot of the places that we're seeing climate change, like really horrible um, climate chaos, is in um, impoverished places or third world, third world countries. Mm. So, um, you know, these places of privilege, is, it's hard to see the effects truly um, because we're just, we're quite sheltered. But in my own, own hometown, you know, um, I can go to the coast and I see, um, I see the effects very clearly. And the starfish are actually um, dying off on the Oregon coast this summer. They've been dying off um, because of a disease that they are linking to um, increased temperatures and, right. and whatnot. Um, and, you know, we're seeing erosion on the coastlines and we're seeing um, effects in our mountains. I mean, you can definitely, if you, want, if you look truly, you can see the connections. Um, but you can also totally turn a blind eye if you want to. Um, you know, I've kind of been raised and brought up with these, these morals, these values, uh, putting, you know, the earth on an equal platform as myself, um, caring for others, caring for, th that includes future generations. So, you know, when I was approached with the public trust uh, lawsuit, it wasn't really like new, new, um, new for me. The law professor who has developed this theory in its more modern uh, garb, mm -hmm. Mary Christina Wood, says it's because the government agencies that are supposed to protect our natural resources have been captured by corporate raiders and lobbyists, yes. that these agencies treat these industries as their clients instead of the public. Do you think that's right? I think, unfortunately, we you know, do have a lot of corruption, a lot of money, a lot of greed that influences most of um, our governmental decisions. So I do think that's, that's right. And that's why we're, you know, going to the courts to hold um, the legislator accountable. Public trust um, states that the government is a trustee to protect these natural resources that every living species, including humans, rely upon um, for our survival, for our well-being. Um, and, and so the public trust says, government, we hold you, um, we trust you to put these resources, air, water, um, land, you know, to protect them for this generation and for many generations down the line. So, Kelsey, why do you think this public trust doctrine applies to the atmosphere? Well, I think it makes perfect sense. You know, we're protecting a forest here, the ocean here, this here. Okay, well, save yourself some time. The, the atmosphere is just the all-encompassing resource that everything depends on, every life force. So to, to kind of not hold that in protection, to let that be exploited and polluted, it goes against our, our rights, and it, it's, it's not just. You remember what, how you felt when the first judge turned thumbs down? Yeah, um, I was extremely disappointed, and, and yet I wasn't um, totally shocked. The, the sh you know, my, my disappointment comes from my, really, my disbelief. How, how can you not, how can you not say yes? How can you not see the importance? How can you not feel compelled to do something? Um, for, you know, first because it's an extremely important issue. It's the most relevant issue, social justice, environmental justice issue of this time. And because we're kids, I mean, that's what I really don't understand. I think there's so much power in having youth stand, you know, in, in court and saying, will you please, you know, protect this vital resource, I would say one of the most vital resources for me and for my children. I think that's so powerful. And so to have someone decline that is just, I don't understand, I don't understand it. Do you think this will get to the Supreme Court ultimately? Do you think you stand a chance with John Roberts, Clarence Thomas, Antonin Scalia, Samuel Alito, and Anthony Kennedy, all of whom basically believe that it's the politicians, the state legislature should, yeah. who should resolve these issues? I have optimism that this will go through. In, in my own state, um, you know, we got dismissed from the trial court. The judge said it wasn't in his 
um, jurisdiction to, you know, follow through with the case. We appealed and um, the Court of Appeals turned it around and said, no, this is, you know, the court has every right to, to follow through. This is in the court's power. Um, the whole theory about having lawsuits and legal actions and, and, you know, throughout the states, and there are international cases as well, is that we, we hope it'll be a, what we call a domino effect. You know, a win here will hopefully influence all the wins across the states because really it, it just takes one brave judge to say, yes, this is important. So how did you feel when the, the Court of Appeals said, gave you a second opinion? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was the last day of high school for me um, and, you know, senior year, so huge celebration. And also I had a, a news story coming out that morning as well on the local NPR station about me um, going on the Great March for Climate Action. And so it was a big morning and I got an email the night before saying, await uh, the results from the court the next morning. And so I woke up, got ready for school. You know, the news story came on um, the radio about me going on the march. And then like five minutes later, I got a phone call saying that the Court of Appeals said yes. And we're going back to court. And I looked to my mom and we both just cried and cried and cried. It was one of the most exciting and happy moments of my life. It's just. So what's, what happens now? So now we go back to the same judge. Um, we go back to the trial court again. Um, and probably with different points, in a way, start over, but now um, with the recognition that the, the courts, you know, do have power um, and they do have a responsibility to follow through with this case. You turned 18 this year. You can now vote. Yes. Do you think voting matters? Good question. You know, it's funny, most of my spiel um, leading up to when I was 18 was, I'm just a kid. I can't vote. I don't have money to, to put into lobbyists and organizations, um, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I have to, to go, you know, go in lawsuit, to, to be in a lawsuit or I have to go to the streets um, to hear, get my voice heard. And now I, I can vote. And the funniest thing is when I turned 18, that wasn't really, it didn't, it, nothing really felt different. Um, I think we absolutely should vote. I also think you shouldn't vote for um, people who don't, you know, um, talk about climate issues. Um, but I think that, that you should in no way stop there. You know, voting is one way to express um, your voice. It's a right that every citizen above the age of 18 has, so therefore I think you should take full use of it. But, you know, voting is sort of like clicking yes to a petition on, online. You know, it's, a, it's an awesome step. I'm glad you took the time. But we can do so much more. We have, um, you know, so many rights and so many freedoms in this country. I really think we should take full advantage of that. That's why I'm on the Great March for Climate Action. What kind of people have you been meeting? The most incredible people, the most inspiring people. Uh, farmers, ranchers, mothers, um, you know, students. Really, I would say, average American citizens. It's really, it's been enlightening to pass through, pass through Nebraska and Iowa especially and, and have Republican ranchers be the ones who are stepping up the most because the Keystone XL is going to go right through their, their farm, the farm that they've had for generations and generations. So it really will affect, it, it's, a, it's a landowner's rights right. problem as well as anything else. And that's something that I, I wasn't really expecting. I flew into Nebraska thinking, oh gosh, what, what, what am I going to expect here? Walking on dusty roads through cornfields and cornfields and <laughs> cornfields. We've had, we've been staying at all these churches, which um, has been really amazing for me because I'm realizing, you know, how, how important it is that we have the spiritual community um, support us and, and how supportive they are of us. What about young people your age? Are they coming out in these towns? I have to say, most of the people that come to support us are of n of not of my generation. And I get asked that a lot, you know, why, where are the youth right. in this movement? Um, I wish I had a really concrete answer. What do you think? I, what I would say is, you know, I guess the thing that I know is my, my, my own story. So I guess I can, I can start there. People ask me why am I on the march instead of going to school as a freshman, um, instead of pursuing my other interests. And the thing is, uh, it would be really easy, really gratifying for me to, to go straight into school. Um, 
And I look at the climate march and I think, wow, that's an awesome movement. I totally support it, but I have these other priorities. And then I take a step back. Wait a second. Kelsey, if you're someone who knows all the issues, has cared deeply and passionately about these issues since you were born, um, and you're not going to take the initiative to really, like we say, walk the talk, to really get uncomfortable and, and take a stand, um, how can I expect other people to? Why are you uncomfortable doing it? Well, there's, there's the very tangible, I'm uncomfortable in this very wet tent with a lightning storm going on and I have to wake <laughs> up at 4.30 in the morning. Um, and then there's the also uncomfortable, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm furious, why am I walking, I'm tired, I want to be doing this right now, I just want some food right now. Um, you know, I don't think this is going to do anything, are we going to have an impact? All these questions happen, all, you know, I ask myself, what will this really do? Um, Good question. What does a march do other than satisfy the marcher? I think the most beautiful thing about the march is that we're collecting these stories, um, these issues from, across, from people across the country, and, and the cool thing is that we're going to carry them to D.C. And, and stand in front of the White House and say, climate change is an issue. It affects all of us. How do we know? Because we have walked across the country. We have been from Los Angeles through the Midwest, um, through Chicago, we have heard the stories, we have seen the effects across the country. Um, so we know because we are sharing the stories of people that we have personally met. And I think that's very powerful. What are some of the changes you would like to see us make? You know, we can recycle, we can buy local, we can do all these really basic things that we have been saying for years. Right. Um, and that's Bravo if you do that, if you as an individual take the initiative to be more green, it's not, it's not good enough. Um, it's really not good enough. I think what we need from the government is to, um, you know, is to make laws um, and to, to limit the amount of CO2 that corporations can emit and to, to really stop using fossil fuels. Um, find renewable sources of energy. It's ridiculous. We have the sun. Um, we have wind. Uh, I'm so happy to see in Iowa so many wind turbines. Like, let's use these natural resources that we have. We have the technology. We have the knowledge. Let's, let's implement that. Um, but I think on a people level, you know, what can we, what can we do? We can really start, start um, using our voices and using our bodies. Um, on the march, we've been talking a lot about civil disobedience. There's only so much talking so much discussion, so many letter writing that you can do right. before you need to just put your body out there and, and um, you know, stand in front of a, of a coal train, um, which people, we, which marchers have done. Can you summarize the most important thing you've learned from marching that you didn't expect to learn? Well, you know, even though I'm only 18, for most of my life, the actions I take today are... Um, are you know with my future children in mind. You want to be a mother? Ab oh my gosh, absolutely. You think this is a healthy world in which to raise children? Um, I no, I I mean yes, it in a way it it is. Um, you know we have children on the march. We have a three-year-old, a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, and we did have a twelve-year-old. He went back to school. I mean, it's so wonderful to see them walking with us. And they talk about the issues incredibly well as for a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. They, they know what's going on. But I just think, you know, if, if, if I'm worried now about having children, I can't imagine, you know, 10, 20 years from now, like, the, the life that they'll take, the worries that will be on me when I'm a mother will just be incred incredible. And, uh, because of climate change. Because of climate change. Because? And, yeah. Because the thing about climate change is it, it, it is... You know, I say this a lot, like, we're looking to the environment for the effects of climate change. We're looking at, um, you know, extreme weather changes, um, droughts, flood, you know, there, there, there's a flash flood in Phoenix, Arizona. There's a drought in California. I mean, this, you can't deny the effects of climate change. Um, a lot of people do. A lot of people do. I guess the, the connection that I'm making is that I've been looking at climate change and the environmental movement as purely environmental. And um, something that's really enlightened me is, is looking at it as a, in a humanity sense, looking at it through um, the effects of, uh, that 
that climate change is having on people. The first moment I dealt with this was when I was first filing my lawsuit. And um, all of the questions about why I was on the lawsuit were very personal. They were, I felt selfish. Why do you care about climate change? Because I you know, won't be able to do these recreational uh, activities because we won't be able to eat these seafoods. And I thought, no, that's not why I care. Those are all selfish reasons. I care because polar bears are dying. I care because you know, these, these bioregions are, are, are falling apart. No, something that is valid and important to recognize is that climate change is a selfish issue. issue. It is totally okay to look at this from purely my own life, the, from the outcome of, of my life. Um, and I think that that's okay. We don't need to only look at ecology. We can look at it as, you know, why do I care about climate change? Because I want to be able to do these things. Because I want to ensure my children will be able to do these things. So looking at it morally, ethically, those things are really important. And I, I feel um, reassured that it's okay for me to think of this from a selfish perspective. Because in the end, like, this is my life. And I'm doing these things for my life and for the future generations' lives and for the environment and for the ecology, but also for me. And so if people, I think if people start looking at it from their, from their own life, of course you'll be compared to action. Of course you want a good life. Of course you want to be able to do the things you want and go the places you want and to be able to breathe clean air and not get cancer or asthma from, from pollution. Of course you want that. Um, so yeah, I think that that's something that's really kind of sunk in. Kelsey, Juliana, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you so much, I had a great time. When the UN Summit opens Tuesday, Kelsey will be back on the road somewhere in the Midwest, reunited with her fellow marchers on their long walk across the continent. And those in the streets of New York City on this weekend before the summit, bearing witness, they will move on too. We owe them our gratitude because they embody what the noted writer and activist Naomi Klein in her new book, This Changes Everything, what she calls a ferocious love, love of life, family, place, love so personal and powerful, it might yet save the earth and the species on it, ourselves included. Such hope unites the global grassroots movement for climate justice. The amounts of carbon dioxide polluting the atmosphere are skyrocketing, higher than in 800,000 years, increasing so fast that when the accounting firm, Price Waterhouse Coopers, recently crutched the numbers, they concluded that we're just 20 years from catastrophe. 20 years. It's even possible now to imagine a world without birdsong. The National Audubon Society reports that of some 650 bird species studied in the United States and Canada, more than half are likely to be at risk from global warming. Frankly, it's hard to fathom my grandchildren's world with nature's winged choir silenced. How long will we allow the climate deniers to give our political leaders cover to run and hide from reality? At our website, BillMoyers.com, on Tuesday, September 23rd, you'll be able to view a special film made for the world leaders and delegates who gathered for the UN's Global Summit on Climate. You'll also see our exclusive web-only interview with the movie makers, Lynn Davis Lear and Louis Schwartzberg. That's all at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. Funding is provided by Ann Gumowitz, encouraging the renewal of democracy. Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. The Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. 
the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Kohlberg Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.